Welcome to the Massey Dialogues. Bienvenue au Dialogue Massey. Massey is a place for ideas. Its mission is to nourish learning and serve the public good. Massey, the College Massey, is built on Indigenous land, the cherished land of the Huron Wanda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we are very grateful for the opportunity to continue to do our work here. Massey is also want to express its support for the struggle of uh, the members of the Black community, a struggle for equality that we support. And I know that many members of our community are struggling right now, and I just want to say how much I support them. And today, I think we're going to be talking about uh, freedom of expression with uh, Eminence Grise, we're people that have thought about this issue for a long time, and I am so grateful to have uh, with me uh, John Russell Soule, who was president of Penn for many years, and he's a great Canadian, brilliant intellectual, the author of the best-selling The Unconscious Civilization, winners of so many uh, awards, I won't mention them all, but just to say how delighted that I am, uh, that you are here and that you are uh, willing to participate in the Massey Dialogues. Uh, we know and we're very grateful for the incredible gift that you've given to Canada and also to Massey. Merci. Thank you for being here. We will have uh, uh, also, uh, because the Massey Dialogues are based on the idea of intergenerational dialogues, I think we're so grateful and so happy to have with us uh, Yona Zifi, who's a PhD student at the Center for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies. She was born in Albania, she was raised in Australia, and she moved to Canada when she was 16 years old. And her experience of having been a refugee uh, aims to be reflected in the work that she now does. Her research interests include the role of human rights, the impact of artificial intelligence and machine learning in immigration and refugee status decisions. She's also the recipient of a Shirk Storyteller Award and uh, a human rights uh, on, for her research on asylum and human rights. And in 2019, she was awarded the Barbara Frum Award in Canadian Scholarship. It's so lovely to have you, Yona, with us. Thank you. And finally, we will be joined by uh, Arun Siddiqui, uh, well known uh, on the, the Massey Dialogues, uh, who is a longtime Massey Fellows. He was, he is the editorial page editor emeritus of the Toronto Star. He served as well as president of Penn from 2003 to 2005, and was a member of the Penn board for many years. And he was also a distinguished visiting professor at the Faculty of Arts and Faculty of Communication at Ryerson University. I am so glad to have you here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you at the Massey Dialogues. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, you all, for being here. So let's start with you, John. Uh, and let's talk a little bit about Penn. What does it do? Why does it exist? And, and how does it relate to is it still relevant, is the question that I want to ask you. Well, the answer to relevance is really simple. There are about 850 uh, writers, journalists in prison today, and uh, over 200 are killed every year. So if you look at all the professions, you know, presidents, generals, heads of corporations around the world, there's usually, you know, five to ten of them in prison and one may be killed a year, if that and a, a thousand, if you like, all told in prison or killed of writers, which tells you about the importance of freedom of expression and how much it frightens people who have power, whether they're governments or organized crime or whatever, or whatever. So it's actually in many ways never been more relevant, uh, but it's always been relevant because there have always been, in the last 50 years, there have always been about 800 or so writers in prison in completely different circumstances. and. Um, you know, so the way it works is there are about 150 pen centers everywhere in the world where, where it's, you can get them set up without immediately going to jail. And so Penn Canada, which Arun and I were both presidents of at different times, is one of the 150 and one of the first going back to 1921. It's one of the oldest, organ I think it's the third oldest civil society organization mm -hmm. after the Anti-Slavery League and the Red Cross. Um, and, and then uh, Haroon was elected to the international board 
and uh, he led a campaign to get me elected as the international president. So it was the first time in about 100 years that a Canadian had the job, and I immediately turned back to him and other Canadians to help me do something which was virtually impossible. And for six years, two terms, I traveled about 70% of the time going into these countries. And I'll tell you, after about three or four years, you really get tired of dictators and authoritarian people. They're very similar. They have no sense of humor. They believe in monologue. They don't listen. And they're very dangerous. And, and, none, of them, and none of them is original. They all say the same things. <laughs> they're, they're incredibly boring. If they weren't dangerous, they'd be ridiculous. But you can be ridiculous and dangerous at the same time. And so you just go in and you look at which, which of the three or four types of awful people are you dealing with today and what can you get them to do? Can you get somebody out of prison or can you get their food in, or their medicine or can you get the LGBTQ community protected? There's always something you can get if you can get into the room. And PAN is about the only international organization where we can pretty well always get into the room because they're, the insecurity of dictators means they're quite eager to be in the company of what they consider to be famous people. Mm. So it's really quite interesting to see, and I see that again and again, this terrible contradiction where they want to have their picture taken with you, and then they gradually realize as the meeting goes on that this is really awful for them, mm -hmm. and they don't know what to do because they have no control over us. They mm -hmm. can't fire us. Mm -hmm. can't, you know, so they so the, the strategy, I mean, it's a strategy of, of shining a light on, on a situation and leveraging a little bit, as you described, the, uh, the prestige of the organization to protect people that are in desperate circumstances. And, you know, you're, so you're mentioning you, you can get something out of it, but how do you measure the success? Like what's... Uh, uh, um, are there stories that you can say about, yes, that strategy really worked well, uh, or are there something to learn about that? Time. It's different every time. The, I took three delegations to Mexico, where it's just one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a writer. Mm -hmm. Turkey is the most likely place to be put in prison, and China not far behind, but they actually kill you in Mexico. And this was the first meeting, and we, were, we, we, we uh, had a whole series of things with Minister of Justice, the Minister of the Interior, but we were sitting there with the uh, three key senators and we wanted them to change the law, which if an honest government ever came to power, would mean that the federal government could actually do something about prosecuting uh, people who killed uh, journalists, which came under the state governments. Mm -hmm. And uh, so two of us, my number two was Japanese and the number three was American. Um, the, the Japanese and myself were getting nowhere arguing and uh, we had a couple of other people there arguing and arguing with these guys. And then suddenly the American, uh, Eric Lax, leaned forward with an absolutely brilliant argument that came out of nowhere. And I just watched these three senators who were getting tired because this had been going on for some time. And, and he said, so why, don't, and Eric, so why don't you just pass this law? Why don't you amend the Constitution on the basis of this basis? And they looked at each other and they said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we all, we all said, okay, you know, and they passed the law, and that law is gradually being put into effect. Or another example, I was in, I won't name the country, in one of the Central Asian republics, and we were trying to get a writer out of prison, a completely innocent older journalist, uh, who was accused of killing two policemen. I mean, he could hardly, and he was an older, not very athletic journalist, and um, he was accused of burning them to death, right? Uh, it's just made up. And um, so anyway, we went to this meeting, we were sitting at a round table, and there were a whole bunch of writers at the other side of the table, Jan Martel and some others. And I was sitting on this, beside the president with the translator on the other side. So I had the president right here and mm -hmm. the translator right there. And um, I figured out what I thought was a very clever way to get to why he should let this fellow out of prison. I won't, won't Tell you, I thought it was brilliant. It turned out to be completely stupid. Um, anyway, after about three minutes, the president got what I was trying to do and started screaming at me. He screamed into my ear for 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And at, at the end, he I was getting really, you know, impatient. Everyone looked horrified. And at the end, he, he couldn't think what else to say. So he said, anyway, how could you know you weren't there? And I was so pissed off that I said to him, well, you weren't there either, President. <laughs> Back to these guys. And, 
And so there was a little silence. I said, why don't we talk about something else? And we knew that the LGBTQ community was in severe danger that they were going to put in place uh, a, an imitation Russian law, mm -hmm. you know, law that yep. prevents you talking about. So I said, well, you know, this is being put through your parliament. Is there anything you could do? And he was so embarrassed at having lost control. That he, that he, said, he said, well, if you promise not to say publicly that I've agreed to this, I'll stop the law. How's that? And I said, Fine. deal's done. And yeah. he did. Yeah. So, so I mean, I could, so I, I could 50 stories like that. That's true. And like, should, should we care about what's going on in the States in this way? You know, like we're watching the authoritarianism in a new form uh, being expressed. Does that, does that worry you? Is there well, well, a... Yeah. Let, let me just say one thing which helps, which is I, I learned right at the beginning when I became president of Penn, which is the Penn Charter written by Galsworthy and fixed up by people like H.G. Wells and so on, uh, and Arthur Miller and so on, um, says we believe in absolute unlimited freedom of expression, one. Two, no writer, nobody should or should promote hatred, and we must always stand against hatred. So that is really a way of seeing freedom of expression and not its limitations, but the ethical context in which freedom of expression has to exist. And so what you're seeing with Mr. Trump, I will never give him a title, um, uh, Mr. Trump uh, doing is uh, spreading hatred. And this makes, you know, somebody who purveys hatred is purveying evil and therefore is a purveyor of evil. And it's really not very complicated. It is, um, I, that's the thing, once you've got it in your mind, it's not very complicated. Um, and you can go into the details. There's no question that you see, you know, every country is flawed. The United States has this enormous flaw in its history, which we all have, but not, that the whole country was built on modern industrialized slavery, which is, that and Brazil are the only two countries to go to that extent of, of constructing what's supposedly a democracy on slavery. Um, uh, even though it does exist, it existed in Canada, it existed everywhere, um, horribly. Um, what, what, what's astonishing is you see how fragile freedom of expression is, yes. how fragile democracy is, and how in two seconds it starts to slip away. Mm -hmm. And the reason that people have fixed on specific things, the murder, but of course, it's the latest murder in a long list of murders, and and and, and calling it a modern lynching, uh, I think, was an absolutely brilliant, horrifyingly brilliant way of describing it. Because of course, in front of a church with a Bible, he who doesn't actually go to church, uh, summarized everything in a strange way of what's wrong. That's right. And I think that's why so many people have grabbed onto it. You know? that's right. Let's bring in the Yona here. Uh, so you're uh, studying, your, I mean, your own experience was about uh, being displaced, being uh, uh, your family had to move and so on. Now you're in Canada studying immigration and refugee. Are they, uh, is this week a difficult week for you? Absolutely. I think it has been a difficult week, you know, for, for everyone. Um, but it's, it's really hard to see how things are unfolding. Um, but I think the, the good news, in a sense, is that I think both in the U.S. context and the, in the Hong Kong context, protesters are being empowered by these things and are continuing to act uh, and speak up on what is wrong with the systems. And I think it's a good thing that they're actually not sort of internalizing these threats right now of these authoritarian regimes. They're, they're taking precisely the, the opposite stance uh, when these threats are becoming very real. So in a way I'm hopeful um, and I feel inspired, I think, by a lot of the, the action that is going on and just the, the tireless work of the organizations on the ground. And I think we really need to do more work to support them. So in your case, uh, did you get a sense that 
people around you? I mean, you were really little when you were in Albania, but did, did your family experience this internalization of threats where you stop talking because you're too afraid of, of what's going to happen? And then you, you even over, uh, uh, you, you are more careful than maybe you need to be. And that's the point. The point is to make everybody afraid and therefore diligent, you know, eliminate all criticism. Yeah, so in a country like Albania, at the time that my family fled, it was on the verge or in the midst of a civil war. Um, you know, there were curfews all day long. I, I don't remember much, but um, at the time, the arms depots opened up, so people were actually allowed to arm themselves. They were using, you know, grenades, all kinds of things. Um, the sort of the key moment in my, my own personal story in my family was that a bullet actually went through our kitchen window um, one day, and that was sort of the, the breaking point for my parents, and they decided that they, they had to flee. And fleeing was a long journey in itself. Um, you know, our family was separated for a number of years. We had to go through smugglers um, and, you know, false documentation to get to Australia. So it was definitely uh, a journey, to say the least. But, and I think that's a difference sort of to speak to John's point about the, the pen charter, which I think was very interesting to point out, that in countries like Albania, they don't have any experience of freedom of expression in a sense. Um, people have never really had these rights. The legacy of communism has embedded this thought and mentality in, in society that they couldn't stand up for their rights. It wasn't an option. Um, so in those cases, they absolutely internalized those threats and saw themselves as incapable of taking any any sort of action. It was completely futile. And I think that's sort of the key difference, in, again, in the US and the Hong Kong context, um, because these protests are continuing and the voices are being heard, hopefully. Um, so I think that's a important distinction to make with countries like the US or, or Canada that have um, chart, like in Canada, we have the Charter of Rights and they have constitutional guarantees of their rights and freedoms compared to many other countries that have never really had these rights to begin with. So uh, let's bring, uh, uh, I was going to bring Arun, but I think he's, he might be busy. Let's bring the, th the three of you, uh, let the three of us together until he comes back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Arun. So let's let's hear from you about uh, your perspective on Penn. So you were also the, the Canadian president. You were on the uh, international board. Uh, you've been talking about the the role of the media and the threat uh, that the media is under. How do you feel this week? No, this week is terrible because just to continue with what John was saying and what Yona is saying. Whereas if we think of the authoritarianism of Austria or the authoritarianism of the old Soviet Union or satellite states, there's a kind of authoritarianism that's going on in the United States at this point. Uh, the president of the United States uh, for the last four years has been spreading hatred against all of those he uh, does not like or he feels threatened by. Uh, and what is happening now is the use of force uh, which is in perfect violation of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. Freedom of speech is threatened, freedom of assembly is threatened, freedom of press is threatened, uh, and, the, and all of that is what's happening in the streets is journalists, cameramen, uh, videographers are being attacked, being attacked both by police on the one hand and being attacked by mobs on the other. Um, no doubt encouraged by all of the hate mongering that Mr. Trump has done for the last four years against uh, what he calls fake news, uh, against what he calls lame media, on and on and so forth. So this idea that uh, uh, that restrictions apply only in authoritarian states uh, is no longer valid as far as the United States is concerned. And that's what we are seeing at this point. And John alluded to the Attorney General. Attorney General of the United States personally ordering peaceful protesters to be removed um, and taking away their freedom of assembly so that the president can go and get himself photographed in a phony way in front of a church. So all of the horrible things that we have talked about uh, for the rest of the world are beginning to happen south of the United States. So that is the relevant point. So it should be added. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, uh, John. Yeah. I mean, it should be added that there's something quite wonderful happening 
at the same time, be, it, surrounded by this awfulness from the government and this continuation of the tragedy of uh, black America, which is that, you know, these two things are guaranteed, freedom of expression and freedom of assembly. And so many things have been done to try and take it away. You know, the, the small number of writers are really not the, the relevant part. I mean, it's, it's a distraction. Um, and, and what's fascinating is, you know, it, it, we don't say this enough. It takes an enormous amount of courage and sudden self-confidence to leave wherever you live and go out into the street and expose yourself and even more to raise your voice when you're out in the street. And what I loved about this week, I mean, it's, yes, it's terrible, of course it's terrible, but what I absolutely loved about this week was that the American government in a supposed democracy drew a line in the sand saying at eight o'clock curfew, you cannot go out. Mm -hmm. And what happened was the streets filled okay. yeah. and people crossed the line, mm -hmm. you know. That's courage, that's freedom of expression. And that is the sign that a large part of the population is not willing to accept the authoritarianism. And, you know, we must never forget that, that it, it's, it's more than a demonstration. It's really, uh, an exp I mean, you know, Martin Luther King was great in mm -hmm. that, but this expression of we will not do what we're told, we will not step back, we will step forward. This is amazing. This is absolutely, this is what makes it worth fighting for freedom of expression. So, uh, you and I were talking about this, about the, the fact that at least that was hopeful for you to see the this resistance, this uh, continuing, the people, you know, expressing, I can't breathe, by to express their outrage that it it's still the same fight it's still asking for decent basic human rights to be observed by the police is there something that that uh that you saw in this uh in your work will that will that this week influence your work a little bit uh as you continue to study human rights and refugee status absolutely i think you know it takes a lot of um resilience and it's a hard fight to change the status quo so it will you know this is not going to happen overnight and this is not necessarily going to change the the systemic structures that we have in place but we are getting one step closer and i think that's what's the most important thing to take away from this week um and in terms of my own work absolutely i think this you know i work with with migrants and refugees who are often uh, very marginalized, racialized people of color, uh, and we have erected many, many barriers, both physical and legislative, to prevent people from seeking safety, uh, which is the, the, the crux of the Refugee Convention. And I'm, I'm curious, I guess, to see how this will impact um, migratory movements. So, so I, I don't necessarily have answers, but, I, but I'm looking forward to sort of seeing what this also impact. Uh, I fear that the impact will be negative, but how this will impact our migrants, our migrants, our migration, our migration, our migration, our migration, our migration, our So it makes me, I, I used to say that the people at their the right to assembly is you that uh, will that will allow you to be truly uh, that you see uh, the population don't really like it's interesting there's an ambivalence toward the right of peaceful assembly you know people the minute there's one riot people just really want it to stop and i'm worried that uh, trump is milking this up you know uh, wanting to talk about disorder uh, to justify his intervention, Arun, you seen that picture? Yeah, you see, in, in this context, it's useful to think in Canadian terms. In the United States, the, 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 the populace and the government and the people are so deeply divided along partisan lines that they now fail to see the common good. Uh, this American absolutism about power, absolutism about partisanship, absolutism 
criticism about the free speech and so on um, has left very little common ground. You, you're on this side or on that side. You look at the Canadian way of doing things uh, pertaining to free speech, pertaining to the topic that we've been discussing and John has been raising. In Canada and Europe, we do not have the American free speech absolutism, for example. Uh, we do have anti-hate laws in Europe as well as in Canada. Because why? Just to restore this balance that John started with, uh, that the Penn Charter speaks about. You have the free speech, but at the same time, the rights of people are uh, to be protected from hatred. This Canadian compromise has been upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada thrice. But unfortunately, we have people in Canada and elsewhere, including in my profession in the media, they speak about the first part, free speech, free speech, free speech. But we rarely talk about the second part. Along with it comes responsibility. Along with it comes a sense of self-restraint. Um, why do you think we no longer call black people niggers? Because it is insensitive. The First Amendment in the United States allows people to do it, but we don't do it. Why do we not do it? Because it speaks to the second part of the Penn Charter and also the Canadian idea that um, balance is important in life. My right to swing my arms stops at your cheek. Mm -hmm. So this idea of balancing things, balancing the right of writers to write, media to write, but up to a point, because this whole notion that we always copy American ideas, you know, we say uh, sen censure but not censor. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer to hate speech is more speech. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, because free speech absolutism in the United States, as we have seen, works for the powerful, uh, works for the rich, works for those who have the money to lobby. It does not work for black people. It does not work for marginalized people. It does not work for many others. And in Canada, this balance that we have crea created, we ought not to forget living next to the United States, that this balance, this equilibrium is very important. So, and do you think that we always get it right, though, that no, we always get this balance right? Uh, let's bring in uh, John here on, on this issue. So are you at Idem? Or do you agree with uh, this? Uh, Good picture of the Canadian Balancing Act. Well, we, we have the mechanisms for getting it right. Very well put. And we have in our history a long list of terrible failures. Most of them, I think, we've admitted to in a fairly um, muscular way since 1960. I mean, John Diefenbaker really brought us around the corner. Uh, it doesn't get credit for that. Um, before the charter. Um, there's no question that as, as uh, people leading the Black Lives Matter movement continually point out, we have not got around the corner in the area of, 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 of skin color, that there are still incredible prejudices built in to our system which have not been dealt with and which need to be dealt with. And, 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 and thank God people, instead of be obsessing about the United States, have turned and said, well, let's use this as an opportunity to try and take another step at home to try and improve things here. This is really, really important to actually turn away from the possibility of just saying, well, it's them. It, 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 yeah, yeah. We have to do it also when they're not trying to do something. Yeah. We have to do it on our own time as well. We can't just do it as, a, oh, the United States is doing it, so we must do something. We have to do it all the time to try to fix it. But, I, but, you know, there are, it, it, the thing about history is you have to be very conscious of the failures and the horribleness, and you have to be conscious of the successes and the breakthroughs. And that allows you to know what it is that you're fighting for. So, you know, I endlessly talk about LaFontaine and Baldwin, who were the, the leaders of the democratic movement that made us into a parliamentary democracy in 18, uh, 11th of March, 1848, very, very flawed in many ways. And then in 1849, the equivalent of people like, the extremists in the government in the United States uh, were not in power. They were so furious, they burnt down the parliament buildings and tried to kill the governor general, the prime minister, and the deputy prime minister, and burnt down a lot of buildings. And a lot of people said, the government is so weak, they're not stopping the rioters from burning down the buildings. And there's a very wonderful document that they put put in an emergency cabinet meeting in which they define what they would and would not do. And they actually said, it would be totally, I mean, I can't remember the exact words. They said it would be totally wrong 
for the government to open fire on the citizenry, whoever they are. So you may want to send that book to, uh, to uh, down south here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's what I mean. Uh, we need a new series of letters to be sent to uh, uh, to uh, Donald Trump. What are the books that you've read this week? Uh, so, Yona, t tell me a little bit more about the the link. I was surprised when you made the link to uh, to migration and the link to the possibility of believing and being protected. And my sense was, I was wondering whether if we circle back to Penn Canada and Penn International, whether the strategy of saving one person, saving a rider, is the right strategy or should we, should we just work more on diminishing the barriers for everyone to leave when they, when they want to or when they need to? So you mean the barriers in terms of migrate, like migratory? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think so. I mean, there's, there's different kinds of barriers that we put in place, and that's that's the whole issue with systemic injustice, right? Sometimes we don't even realize that these obstacles are in place, um, or we make them, we package them in a pretty box and make them seem like this is just a, a legal process that migrants need to go through. Um, the closing of the Canadian-U.S. border, I think, is a good example of this, um, you know, under the guise of the pandemic, we closed our border to people in need and people who are not uh, safe. So the so third country agreement with the U.S., I think, is you know dubious right now. Um, so yes, as, as Canada, you know, as a country, we do need to do more to assess migrants uh, and asylum seekers, and you know, this flows um, for people in need, and we have a duty and a responsibility. Canada, especially as a signatory to the Refugee Convention, to to aid in this process, right? Maybe not necessarily the to aid in the flow, but once they are on Canadian territory, migrants and asylum seekers do have access to charter rights, um, you know, from the same case. And I think we need to do a better job at protecting, um, especially for you know migrants who are such a vulnerable and a precarious group. Um, and and I. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I just I remember that if we're talking about freedom of expression for people that have arrived from a different country, they're often so worried about being deported if they are arrested that their ability to exercise freedom of peaceful assembly, freedom of expression is actually quite limited. And sometimes we don't think about the, the sense of vulnerability uh, that that may exist. Let me. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I, do you wanted to complete your thoughts, maybe? Yeah, sorry, I just want to add some, absolutely. You know, migrants are in a precarious position, especially asylum seekers who are awaiting a decision on their case. So you're you're 100% right. They they have this fear to, to speak up and express themselves because they may be deported. And if they're deported, they will be sent back to a country which they were fleeing persecution from. And a potential country that is an authoritarian regime where they can be imprisoned or, or killed. Um, and not to mention that migrants and asylum seekers do not have the right to, to vote or participate in, um, in, in the process uh, as citizens can. So they really depend on citizens to speak on their behalf and to act on their behalf. Related to that issue is really uh, relating to immigrants and refugees and so on. The point it also affects newer minorities in Canada, for example. In the public narrative, um, the least amount of respect, dignity is given to the newest arrivals in this country, unfortunately. Um, we always find people uh, to attack and to criticize and, 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 and to demean. Uh, what I mean by that is there was a time when uh, black people were demonized, uh, were demeaned, or there was anti-Semitism. Uh, we maligned Jewish people for the longest time. Then there were gypsies and there was somebody else. The latest victims have been Muslims in the post-9-11 era. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have differing standards, even while we pay obeisance to free speech, even while people like me um, pay obeisance to this great Canadian balance, it does not always work and we have to be vigilant because um, when it comes to free speech, uh, we have total double standards. Anti-Semitism, no. Uh, homophobia, no. Uh, 
Uh, misogyny, no. Islamophobia, fine. Uh, that's what's been happening for the last 15 or 20 years or so. So we have this massive gap, despite all the mechanisms that John talked about, which are present in this country, uh, the, neither the law nor its practice falls equally on people. And we are full of hypocrisy and double standards when it comes to these things. Uh, uh, you can malign Muslims as much as you like, but you, you cannot dare to malign other groups because why? because we have become sensitized. Mm -hmm. we have become, our values have changed for the better, mm -hmm. but our values have not changed for the better for the most vulnerable people since 9-11, namely Muslims. We are blind to this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to defend free speech of the cartoonists to draw Prophet Muhammad the way they want to draw. Uh, Pen American Center wants to give a, a word of courage to Charlie Hebdo for having the courage to draw these things. I challenge you, if mm -hmm. Pan American Center have given the same award to some cartoonists who would have drawn anti-Semitic cartoons, mm -hmm. or would have drawn homophobic cartoons, or would have drawn racist cartoons, or would have drawn uh, misogynist. Yeah. So we are full of hypocrisy and double standards, and we need to look in our own conscience, mm -hmm. see that this is an ongoing course, we learn all the time, and we need not be too smug about how well we do it. So uh, let's bring, yeah, John, come on, come on in, John. Well, I was just going to add that, well, as you know, and I, I, I don't know if Fiona knows, I'm with my wife, co-chair, and we started something called the Institute for Canadian Citizenship and, and a gathering called Six Degrees. Um, and so we think and work a lot in this whole area of immigration, uh, refugees, uh, stateless people, citizenship, and so on. And, you know, I think it goes back, Natalie, to your question about you know, do you try to get the single person out of prison or into the country mm -hmm. or their citizenship or do you go for the bigger issues? And the answer is you have to do both all the time. I mean, it's an absolutely endless task, as it will always be. You have to do both because if you only deal with the one person, you don't have a direction. You don't know what it is. You don't know what the ethical shape of what you're trying to do is. And if you only deal with the big picture, you lose the grassroots, the reality mm -hmm. of people suffering, individuals suffering because they can't get in or because they're in and they don't have the right, uh, they're not being treated properly, uh, they can't get a job because of their situation and so on. So it's a very, very complicated uh, mix. I mean, in some ways Canada does better than other places, but in, on the other hand, as Haroon says, you know, we're filled with hypocrisy at the same time. And I mean, I'll give you a single example of that. I mean, we allow most of our professions to be run by themselves at a provincial level. So the lawyers are run by their own organization provincially and so on. And these, are, these are protection rackets. They prevent new Canadians who have pretty good credentials from practicing in those professions, which is why they're doing you know, something at a level below what they're trained to do. And they can get those, often they can get those credentials, but only if they go through the most backbreaking a series of barriers. Yeah. And so right now we're carrying out a campaign which is about changing, the, getting rid of the barriers in Canada over credentials. Um, I think it's called Stand Together or something like that. And so, I mean, this, this is the sort of, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, uh, immigration, citizenship, all of these things fit together. And you just, you have to wake up every morning and start again. You know, yeah. Because it can be swept away in two seconds, if you blink. That's true. Well, and, and indeed, there's one good question here about what should one do to engage with oneself and others to increase the ethical demand within oneself and collectively that freedom of expression demand? I mean, since the beginning, we talked about it's, it's a right, but it's also a duty. It's a duty not to uh, engage with freedom of expression in a way that promotes hatred. So how do we promote this sort of ethical framework for people to recognize that that aspect of it. Arun. The ethical framework I can think of is that we should be honest with ourselves. We should ask ourselves, um, when I go to bat for this person, am I going to bat for that person only because I agree with him or her? But I will not go to bat for uh, some minorities about whom we don't care. So we need this ethical framework that we have to be constantly questioning ourselves and our own double standards uh, as we go forward. 
Uh, and back to John's point, you know, I mean, there is no silver bullet here. Uh, we have to we have to act on a different fields. The, the the most important thing that can be said in this context in Canada uh, is multiculturalism. And I say that because uh, it's not a fad. It's a legal constitutional obligation that we are all multicultural, meaning your culture, my culture, black culture, Aboriginal culture, they all are worthy of equal dignity and equal respect. Uh, this is what is not found in the United States, for example, this land of immigration, Statue of Liberty, and so on and so forth. This homogenizing effect, torrent of homogenization that happens in the United States uh, does not happen in Canada. That happens in France, does not happen in Canada. What, how is this related to what we are talking about? It gives you some measure of uh, dignity. It gives you a measure of freedom to say what you want to say. And it gives you the freedom not to be stampeded by majoritarian mores and majoritarian views, that if you are a dissident, your voice will be heard. That is the essence of all of this in the Canadian polity that's generally missing, both in France, um, La Cité, uh, and in, in and the United States. So, which is not to say we are perfect, but we are somewhere in the right area. So, if Yona, do you see that that there's some protection in creating a group that has value, where we value every, you know, if you come from a, another country and you're not, you're, you, we don't ask you to just become uh, similar to everybody else. We want you to preserve who you are, uh, who, what's your group is like, what your culture is. Did you feel that? Or, or do you think it's a bit of a myth? Um, well, I think it's very important um, that we do let people, you know, maintain their own beliefs and cultural values, um, traditions, customs, uh, and we're all respectful of one another. And so to build on Haroon's point, um, I think the key is really to educate ourselves and educate ourselves about the different people and cultures in our communities. Um, I myself haven't really felt that in, or, or rather like I haven't felt any issues about that in Canada and I'm, I've always felt very respected of my, my culture and um, you know my, my background. I can't say that the experience was the same in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it, was, it was a while ago and, and I don't remember too much but there I do have sort of distinct memories of um, of not being as accepted. I, uh, you know, I, I look white. I, so in a lot of ways, I have some privileges. Uh, many times I was referred to as the ethnic kid in class. I wasn't even really sure what that meant or how to, to understand that. Uh, but it has definitely stuck with me. <laughs> So, uh, John, you've, you've dedicated your life to, the, to, to, to this issue. Uh, and that's what Six Degrees is all about. Uh, any, what do you see as the future? Uh, well, I think there's, there's, there's two really interesting things. And I, I would put them maybe slightly differently, but not, not in disagreement. One, one is that, that there's no question that what Haroon was referring to, which is the melting pot theory, which is the Europe, old European idea that a nascent state is based on oneness, that everybody must be the same. With, you know, in, in religion, whatever, every way. Um, and that, 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 so the United States is very similar to Europe and Canada is very, very different from Europe because we've always been this mess. Mm -hmm. And there's yeah, nothing yeah. wrong with being a mess. mess. A, you know, a mess is good, complexity <laughs> is good. And, and the way I put it in, increasingly is that the difference between believing that people must have one personality, one mm -hmm. identity, Versus, you know, we're all capable of having multiple personalities. Mm -hmm. And it isn't the government or a political party that has the right to tell us what our personality or identity is. We'll decide that. And, and we're the source of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So we as citizens are the source of loyalty. Governments are not the source of loyalty. We are. So you know you're moving towards authoritarianism when governments start telling you what it is to be a Canadian or an American or a French person. Or the French tell you that you must be wearing a hijab and if you wear a hijab, 
you'll be fired from your job. Yeah. But, but but they should not be telling you this kind of thing. So that would be the multiple, what I call the multiple personality order, I think is a really uh, important way of seeing ourselves. And then the second thing is on ethics. Uh, I mean, I wrote about a book called On, on Equilibrium. You know, ethics is like a muscle. Mm -hmm. It works if you use it all the time. You know, a lot of people watch too many movies and think the day will come when they will be called upon to save the world or the country or whatever. But you know, if you haven't been doing it every, if you haven't been making place for an older person on a bus, yeah. if you haven't been, when you're at a dinner and you hear somebody make an, an Islamophobic or anti-Semitic or anti-black remark, and you just sat there and didn't mm -hmm. lean forward and say, look, you can't say that. Mm -hmm. And either, either this person apologizes or they leave or I leave. You know, you, you, so those are the muscles of, of ethics, and you have to use it. Every, you you wake up in the morning, you go out the door, and the day, every day, the most of your day is filled with ethical choices. Some of them are minuscule, and if you do that every day, when the great crisis comes, you'll probably be okay mm -hmm. because you're used to doing it. That's, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, that's that's lovely. But uh, let's exercise our ethical muscles uh, here. So, what, what? How does it translate to you? What do you think about that, Arun? When we he you hear this, and do you reflect that in in the way we value what's going on today this week? <laughs> no, you, you see, I always talk about this Canadian example, not because I want to come across as overly patriotically Canadian and so on. In fact, I'm one of those who says. You don't have to be, you don't have to be, pretend to be patriotic like Americans feel the, every immigrant is more American than uh, every uh, other American. No, because there is merit in the sense of Canadianness that we do have. Mm -hmm. um, what is the British North America Act? 1867 people don't know, don't forget, we all forget. It was the first constitution that established not only individual rights, but also collective rights. Yeah. Yeah. This idea uh, that the Aboriginal peoples are a collectivity. Mm -hmm. This idea that English speaking people are a collectivity. Mm -hmm. This idea that French speaking people have a collectivity and they need some support mm -hmm. and support from each other and so on. And since then we have expanded it to multi We are not totally absorbed in individual, mm -hmm. That's it. like the Americans or totally absorbed in this pursuit of happiness. We want government. And there's a, there's a reason for it. And this equilibrium that we have in Canada ought not to be forgotten. And when the Quebec government follows France, for example, saying, you cannot wear the hijab or the niqab, we'll fire you from your jobs. What for? Because we want to ostensibly save you from your patriarchal father, mm -hmm. patriarchal brother, patriarchal husband, so they fire them. That's it. No job. <laughs> that gives them the independence from these very people that we are trying to save them from. It talks to you about how we can lose sight of common sense mm -hmm. when we go too far. America is full of these examples and we are witnessing it. In Canada, we are not immune. We see these examples taking place in Quebec and elsewhere. And it's interesting the now... For a long time, the idea was if you wear a mask, it's not socially acceptable. If you were you know, covering your face, it was socially unacceptable because you were not being. And now it's absolutely it's essential it's to cover your face to be socially acceptable. So there's a real <laughs> irony in the mask, uh, particularly uh, in in uh, in France, in, in Belgium and in Quebec as well. So, you know, let, let me bring you in here about the. So you're the young person here, and uh, we talked about uh, ethical uh, muscles, uh, reflecting on ethical duties. Do you see your generation as uh, challenging more the older ones by being more ethical, maybe? Well, I don't know that we're being more ethical, but I think uh, we definitely are being ethical. I think young people are taking, um, you know, a lot of action, and they they tend to share things within uh, their groups and with each other quite quickly and at a very, uh, you know, quick rate in general. So things travel, um, 
I think perhaps a lot faster and information and the sharing of things uh, between their networks travels a little bit faster than perhaps with uh, older generations. Um, I would like to think that we are exercising our ethical muscles on a daily basis, even through small acts, as John mentioned, you know, giving up your seat on the TTC or something of that sort of nature. Um, but I also think that young people nowadays are, again, that, that courageous piece there. They're going out on the streets. They're standing up for these rights. They are voicing their opinions uh, and they're voicing their rights and they're not backing down. They have an incredible courage and, um, you know, they're very resilient. So I, I hope that uh, we're on a good path. <laughs> you see, speaking of the young people, I mean, they are they have been the most adept at, for example, using social media for good, as opposed to the racists and xenophobes and so on who are using the social media, along with Mr. Trump, to spread hate. Uh, these are the people who brought Arab Spring. These are the people who used it in the Green Revolution. These are the people who are active in the Maidan in Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the people who are stringing ideas and people together. Yet at the same time, I think what has been happening uh, that this, what was promised to us as the nirvana of uh, togetherness uh, has broken down into silos. I read, uh, uh, and I read only what I want to read, mm -hmm. uh, only to those people who agree with me. Mm -hmm. um, the common space of democracy is getting eroded by the very institutions that promised us more democracy, paradoxically and ironically. And we are all falling in our own silos and we are shouting at each other. And the common space that makes democracies work is reducing, is shrinking, which is what Mr. people like Mr. Trump do. And this is really the responsibility of the young people now, are to take the social media back into their own hands and make it a force of good. Um, so all that has happened is all these young people used it for good, uh, but who monetized it? Corporations, Mr. Zuc uh, Zuckerberg, Facebook, and Twitter and so on and so forth. Uh, you are contributing to their billions of dollars of profit. Uh, and who, who, is, who is the second most effective user of this? Racists, xenophobes, uh, Islamophobes, anti-Semites, uh, white nationalists and so on. So this is a great modern concern at this point uh, as to how do you, I raise, use the word very carefully, how do you tame the mean social media at the same time keep it as a force of good. I, also pray, I just want to add something quick. I also hope that this will lead more young people to the polls. Um, I think it's really critical that you know young people do exercise their right to vote and perhaps they haven't done a very good job of that in the past, but hopefully now is the time to, to remind them of the importance of their vote. Yes. That's I mean, good. I would take that a step further, which is that you know, going in the streets, speaking up, voting, those are all preparations for the one thing that matters, which allows you to, in fact, change things, which is power. Yes. You know, that if you occupy power, mm -hmm. you can actually change things. And mm -hmm. this is what we, this is, for me, the most important element that's been in a great, to a great extent lost in the last half century, which is several generations have chosen to be outside and not interesting. Very ethical attacks on unethical behavior. But it, it, up to a certain point, those who hold the power hold the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And whether they're large corporations or governments, uh, to a certain extent, they wait their time and do what they want in the end. Mm -hmm. So that we've seen time after time incredibly successful public demonstrations not leading to what everybody thought they would lead to because because the raw because who holds power and yeah. why do they hold power and i think that the revolution that i'm waiting for is the moment when people who are somewhere between 18 and 16 and 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 35 let's say actually want to take power yes. to actually pass the laws and enforce the laws which will make the changes that are required. And it is so not without that, without that, our hopes for serious change are very limited. And it is not an accident. It is not an accident that people like Mr. Trump and the Republican Party in the United States 
have systematically, for the last 15 or 20 years, have tried their best to disenfranchise yes. as many number of people as they could. Mm -hmm. All those who are not likely to vote Republican are disenfranchised, starting with the black people, starting with the Aboriginal people, um, starting with the young and so on. And lest we be too smug about it, mm -hmm. the Harper government tried to do something similar in Canada, mm -hmm. to yeah. not encourage. In fact, they had the goal to tell the chief election commissioner that he should not advertise and promote voting in Canada. Can you believe this uh, in, in this country? No, so that's from this China. idea that we need to vote, we need to mobilize, we need to have more people given franchise and utilize that franchise to be able to make the changes that we all want to make. So, so Yuna, have you ever thought about what would you think about actually going into politics? Or do you ever talk about this with your friends? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, in March, just a couple of days before we went into lockdown, I participated in the Women in House program on behalf of Massey. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we spent uh, a day shadowing an MP member uh, in Ottawa and got a little bit of a, of a taste of committee meetings and things of that sort of nature. And I came back quite inspired and um, good. <laughs> that, you know, maybe I go into politics and not academia. Um, good. But then again, I, I, you know, not being a citizen yet, I'm not sure how um, that would impact a potential journey into politics. But who knows? I'll, I'll throw it out there for now. <laughs> Well, this is uh, so we're coming to the end of, of our show. It's good to invest in uh, uh, good politicians. Don't don't <laughs> lose that thought. Uh, so maybe I'll invite you. Well, we start with you, Yona. Concluding thoughts. What would you want uh, the audience to remember about this this uh, this talk about freedom of expression at this time? I think my, my main point would just be to, you know, it's really important right now to educate ourselves on what is happening and we need to take it upon ourselves to, to learn more and learn more about, you know, uh, community, racialized communities that are being impacted the most by systemic injustices and how and why that is happening. I think a lot of people don't necessarily have um, a good understanding of the issues. Uh, so I think that's key. And second, I think we really need to do our very best. We need to do more to support organizations on the ground and the people who are doing a lot of this work. But also we need to ask of our politicians and governments, we need to hold them accountable. Um, you know, in the in Toronto, we have the death of Regis Korchinski Paquette, and we still don't have answers. Um, so I think it's up to us to, to push. Um, you know, governments are policymakers for more answers, more accountability, and also a big issue in Canada, which funny I mentioned at the end, but it's just the collection of race data. Uh, we don't collect enough race data um, in Canada, and we need that data to show politicians and our policymakers that this is a real issue. They often don't listen without statistics and numbers to back it up. Um, and we need to start collecting this data in Canada. I think it's, it's critical. Thank you. Arun. Oh, be more Canadian. <laughs> you know, we have problems in this country, we need to improve them, but be more Canadian. Thank you. What a good, lovely. What about you, John? How can you top that? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the thing that for me has been the most hopeful over the last, say, 10 years is the increasing appearance in the public place of uh, young indigenous intellectuals yes. and indigenous thought. And I think that, frankly, I think that the most interesting and breaking of the molds thinking happening in the country is coming, no offense, you know, but <laughs> I'm also insulting myself, so, in, and Varun and all of us. Um, I think that the most interesting stuff is really being said by a lot of the young indigenous intellectuals and some of the elders and some fantastic mm -hmm. books. And I think it's bringing to the table ideas which are not the product of Europe. Mm -hmm. It's bringing ideas that come from here that are a part of what here really is over thousands of years. And, and by bringing it to the table, they're saying, Hey, you girls and guys, 
um, we've decided to allow you to look at this because we think you could benefit from it. And I think we could benefit enormously from looking at these very, very different approaches towards how societies work. And I think the ideas of complexity and the relationship between freedom of expression and citizenship and the land are far more developed in indigenous uh, philosophy than they are in Western philosophy. So I think there's an enormous amount to take there. And then I would just take really, I think what, 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 what Nuno was saying, which is at, at the end of the day, this is all grassroots. Democracy lives and dies. Freedom of expression lives and dies on grassroots. That's not out of control individualism. It's the willingness of individuals to put themselves forward in some way which will probably be risky to their career or whatever, and to speak, and to keep track, and to demand, and so on. If we don't do that, if we're silent, then we have nothing. We have nothing. So great words. We don't want to be silent, and we don't want our community to uh, to be silent. So I invite you to continue to suggest ideas for dialogues. Uh, that's part of the mission of, of Massey College, to allow that space where we can actually discuss issues across generations and across disciplines. And next week, I think we're going to uh, talk first about uh, the role of women in the recovery, so a feminist agenda for economic recovery. Uh, I hope that we will have, uh, if not a completely new episode on, on uh, anti-black racism, but at least referring to the, the great work, the first dialogue that we had on policing, race data, and, 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 and the black community in Canada, the importance of, of race data that Yona mentioned today. And finally, we'll talk about cultural diplomacy. Can the arts help us understand the world and, and support citizenship uh, across the world? Merci beaucoup. I want to thank you all three for being there. It was wonderful, great conversation, and also great ideas and uh, uh, pearls of wisdom that we want to, uh, uh, to give to Canadians. Thank you again.